I'm Lizzie Daly, your host, and I am super thrilled to be back for yet another epic live today. If you're new around here, welcome, welcome, welcome. You are in for a treat today. If you've been following over the past few weeks, let me tell you, we have been on quite a journey across the world, chatting to experts and scientists, learning all about fascinating science and natural world behaviours and new science that's happening around the world. We've met with uh, Dr. Rayren Grant talking about how to be a bear biologist. Last week we were in Hungary learning about the meadow viper and how venom, the world's deadliest venom, can be applied uh, to us and our world and medicine in the most mind-blowing ways. Um, now if you are new around here, hello, I'm a biologist and wildlife TV presenter. So thrilled to be hosting today's live with our very special guest who I'll introduce very shortly. But I can tell you that today we're going to be heading below the waves. This is probably a topic that I absolutely, probably one of my favourites to be honest. I'm not a marine biologist, but I have an absolute love for the ocean. So if you do as well, this is your opportunity to get your questions into myself and our expert today live all about coral. I'm sure you have massive questions about coral. What is coral? How does coral reproduce? Where can you find coral on the planet? Pretty much anywhere. But coral is a mind-blowing, incredible, incredible marine invertebrate that there is so much more to learn about. One of my favourite things to see on a dive is always the vibrant colours of coral. And yes, you get vibrant rock coral even here in rainy Wales here in the UK where I'm coming to you live. In fact, in the UK, I have a bit of a love for marine invertebrates in general. This was my, me diving with the giant jellyfish just last year. Um, and it was a real giant and just a fascinating group that perhaps many of us have misconceptions about you know, um as i said many of us may not even know what coral is so today is all about delving into the science and and the information about some of the most widespread diverse and vibrant corals of our planet so who are we talking to, to today well we are chatting to dr erica morsley who is all about coral she's a marine biologist she spent the past 15 years actually studying coral. She's a National Geographic explorer and she about well a number of years ago started a non-profit organization called the Hydras because she herself has big questions about coral and so wanted to share information about this whole group um, to us, to you and I, to the wider public, to kids and education kits and VR. She basically is bringing coral to us in classrooms, in our living rooms, to our home so we can all learn more about coral and experience it. Now, very excitingly, at the end of today's live, we are going to show you how you yourself can go on a VR dive deep into the ocean to meet coral. But before we do that, we've got lots to learn. I've got lots to learn. And Erica is actually with us here now live. Erica, hello. Hello, Lizzie. I am so excited to go diving with you today. Thanks so much for I having me. Do you know, I've been looking forward to this one, Erica, because I have a serious love for the ocean, but I actually have many, many questions about coral. So I guess an obvious place to start is you and your journey in the past 15 years, incredible, incredible work. Why coral? It's <laughs> a great question. Coral are just absolutely fascinating animals. And as you mentioned, they're found all over the world. There are corals that are deep. There are corals that are in cold water, even up in Alaska. They exist from the equator to the poles. And they are living animals, but they also have characteristics of plants. So they have partnerships with types of algae to photosynthesize, to gain energy. And they can turn seawater into rock. I mean, wow. they're miraculous. And the rock that they build creates these amazing geological structures that provide habitat. So the tropical shallower water coral reefs are the ones that I've been exploring for the last 15 to 20 years as a scientist and as a diver. And this, the more I learn, the more enamored I become because they're so beautiful and so fascinating. 
Absolutely. And yeah, as we I was reading about this um, before we went live, you know, over 6,000 different species of coral. But I, I know you specifically look at how changing oceans can can impact corals and how they develop. And we'll talk about how they reproduce as well very shortly. But um, you touched on it just then. Actually, wh what is coral? I know our audience are really hot on this kind of thing and they're really knowledgeable. But if you could describe coral as an organism, what actually is it? So corals are relatives of jellyfish and anemones. So they're soft bodied and they're made up of lots of little polyps. So if you can imagine a central mouth surrounded by multiple tentacles and those soft body polyps are what secrete calcium carbonate structure. So the aragonite or limestone that builds the habitat. So here we have a still image of our 360 film that sort of wow. shows the structure and they're colonial animals that can bud and clone and grow while laying down rock essentially. And so even though they're made up of very small individual polyps, they can build massive structures that cover large areas. So it's a and really fun you... play on scale. Yeah, I mean, even just thinking about that, it is a fascinating um, um, organism to look at. Um, but you spent a lot of time on the Great Barrier Reef, right? Tell us more about that. That must be the place for coral, surely. Oh, absolutely. It's the largest reef system in the world. The Great Barrier Reef runs about uh, 2,000 kilometers long and covers a large area. It's a marine protected area in Australia. And I've been so fortunate to spend so much time on islands and underwater and on boats, exploring and diving in these amazing places. And it's just been a joy and a privilege. And I've also seen these places change pretty rapidly over just you know, the few years that I've been exploring them. Wow. And yeah, I, I can't even imagine how much you've seen. Um, but if you, I'm just thinking of the, the general diver now. I mean, for anyone who, who isn't a coral expert like you, you may hold onto a reef and see just a load of colours. How many coral species can you get in, in one reef, say, if you go on one dive? Absolutely. So the hard coral, so the reef building corals, also known as scleractinians, uh, there are about a thousand species around the world. At Places on the Great Barrier Reef, you might see 400 or so. Um, but if you go into places like Indonesia, where the species richness is the highest on earth, you'll get even more than that. And wow. the, usually the further you go away from the equator, the fewer types of species there are, even if the abundance is high. Wow, okay, that's interesting. Is, is there a reason behind that at all? Yes, and so, so much of coral reefs and where they're successful has to do with suitable habitat and suitable parameters. So for instance, the aragonite saturation in the water has to be right. So the water chemistry has to be conducive to coral growth. The mm -hmm. temperatures have to be within a certain range that allows for them to grow, survive and reproduce over many generations. And for the coral reefs that I generally work with, you need relatively shallow water. So like on the Great Barrier Reef, you have this amazing continental shelf that goes out many miles that doesn't go straight into deep water. So it allows for access to sunlight for those mm. species that need sunlight to generate energy. Absolutely fascinating. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that kind of fits into your really important research a little bit later on. Um, I've got to ask, do you have a favorite coral? I know what mine is, but only... <laughs> Local. You must have one, surely. <laughs> I have a few favorites. <laughs> um, I really like Stylophora pistillata because okay. it's just really vibrant colors. Um, it has sort of a fuzzy appearance because their tentacles are usually extended and right. it can be bright pink, bright blue, and it's just absolutely beautiful. I also really like Goniastria favilis, <laughs> which mm. exists usually <laughs> at high latitudes and have unique ways of reproducing and surviving in really difficult places. 
So I like the spirit of that species. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My uh, favorite coral is um, not a scientific name here. It's cup coral, which is a lot easier to spell for the team in the chat. Try and spell out those two species. But um, love cup coral is um, on my on my local coast. So fabulous. And what's great I mean, about cup coral is that they don't necessarily have to be in big colonies. They can be on their own, fighting the elements and sort of singular polyps in cold and deep areas. So yeah. They're tough. They are. They're tough. And I mean, it's here in the UK. We don't have the best diving spots, but we've still got cup coral, which <laughs> says a lot about how brilliant they really are. Um, OK, so, I mean, that's kind of looking at the, the basis of, of what coral is. Um, silly question. What do coral eat? How does it work? How What's their ecology like? Great question. So with these uh, hard reef building corals, most of the energy that they get to survive comes from their photosynthesizing algae partners. So a plant-like organism that actually lives in their soft tissues of those polyps. And they generate energy from the sun, essentially, just like a plant on land would do. And that energy leads to about 70% of what the coral needs to survive. And then the tentacles to make up the remaining uh, energy that they need can yeah. capture small organisms from the water in what's called, you know, collect in just collection and sort of filter feeding of um, different particles of things that just happen to be floating by because corals can't really move around and hunt. They just stay in one place. They're basically cemented to the seafloor while the water current brings food. But I guess the more healthy the ocean, the larger the reef eventually? It depends. It really okay. just matters what the parameters are and how certain species are locally adapted to those environments. Although okay. in recent years, especially in the Caribbean and on the Great Barrier Reef and other large reef systems, we have seen them declining pretty rapidly over recent years from the combined effects of a lot of things including overfishing, habitat destruction, uh, mm. pollution, and also yeah. rising ocean temperatures are making it pretty stressful for coral animals at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure many people watching have um, heard about the decline of, of coral, and I'm sure you'll tell us more about it shortly. Um, so you've worked extensively on coral across the world. Um, fascinating uh, research and your application with VR in connecting us all to coral is fabulous but before we go into that um, I have a question for you is and it's really kind of an important one right in terms of how life is formed and continues <laughs> how does coral actually reproduce it's a question that's been <laughs> on my mind now for a wee while <laughs> well this is my area of expertise and it's my favorite thing to talk about so as I mentioned coral that I generally study are hard corals as opposed to soft corals, which are sort of the sea fans that you yeah. might get move with the water current, but the but hard corals build the reef. And so when I study coral reproduction, I like to call it hard coral porn. Brilliant. And what happens <laughs> is in order for these ecosystems to regenerate and persevere and continue, especially following disturbances like cyclones or bleaching events or any kind of habitat destruction, you need these amazing mechanisms to replenish themselves. So corals can reproduce, reproduce asexually as well, so they can clone themselves and that's how they actually build the reef. But the sexual reproduction is fascinating. So imagine you're a coral, you're basically cemented to the seafloor, <laughs> you can't move around. It's how fun. Do you, yeah. <laughs> You're doing a great job. How do you find a mate when it's time to breed? And it's not yeah. like a tree or a flower because there are no pollinators in the ocean. Right. So what's happened is corals have developed this amazing synchronicity. We're cued by lunar cycles and water temperatures. They all spawn at the same time. Wow. So over the course of a few nights, following a full moon in the springtime, after the sun goes down, corals release these bundles that can be pink or red or orange, filled yeah. with egg and sperm. So these are the hermaphroditic species, the ones that yep. have both male and female gametes. And those bundles are positively buoyant. So they float up to the surface and break apart from the water movement and then can cross fertilize with other genetically distinct uh, colonies from other areas. 
And that fertilized egg over the course of a few days will develop into a coral larva, which can then wow. when it's ready, settle back down on a reef and metamorphose into a new polyp and then grow and grow cloning itself to build the reef on top of its ancestors essentially. And it's known as the most synchronized sex event in the whole animal kingdom. And it's just such wow. a privilege to be diving during this. And so that image you just saw, just imagine all of these orbs of colorful yeah. egg and sperm bundles floating around you. It's like and being it's huge in- number. Oh yeah, oh my gosh, billions and billions and billions. Just a table coral or an acroporid this big can produce about a million eggs. So imagine wow. that for many miles, it's just a bonanza. And there are a lot of fish that are spawning around that time. Giant clams are spawning around that time. I've been on island research stations that are also bird sanctuaries and they're yeah. nesting and the turtles yeah. are coming up on the beach to lay yeah. eggs. So it's a very sexy time on the reef. Sexy time on the reef, hard coral port. I just, it's actually mind blowing. The way that animals have this way of kind of still being able to reproduce despite how they live. You know, you hear about sperm casting. It's kind of like an extreme version of that, isn't it? Launching across the ocean. Honestly, that is mind blowing. So just, just cause that is fascinating. Um, a particular species will release, will go into that spawning event and that um, sperm for that species will fertilize the same species, but perhaps in a completely different geographical region. Is that yeah, right? Absolutely. And the currents can take that spawn and that larvae many, yeah. many miles, like thousands of kilometers, depending on the water motion, because they're just passive drifters and they're going yeah. where the ocean takes them essentially. Wow. Wow. You have the coolest job ever. <laughs> so interesting. That is absolutely fascinating. And, and do you have some coral with you? Because we've talked about some species. I and do. All this. And what yes. I love about this is this actually isn't real coral. This is oh, a wow. reproduction of a real colony from Hawaii. So my wow. team and I, we went diving and took lots and lots of pictures of this living coral on the reef. And we we're able to stitch it together in a method of reality capture called photogrammetry. And we yeah. we're able to turn that into a digital 3D model that is informative because it gives us things like volume and surface area to understand its ecology even better. And we could 3D print it. And so this uh -huh. coral, we hope is still alive and well on the reef. So this is a non-destructive way to teach about coral, to show um, just how beautiful and interesting they are. Mm -hmm. We've also painted this particular colony a certain way to visualize okay. what it's like for a coral to partially bleach and okay. lose color. We also have a pretty amazing ability to 3D print with wow. so this didn't but require that painting. Yeah, what so this is a Pasolopra mandrina. Okay. It's a pretty small colony. Uh, of course, it's scale, so it's actually a lot smaller than it is in the ocean. But what was really cool is when we printed this, it printed as its natural colors. Okay. And so wow. we didn't have to paint it. And so, wow. the, so this would make amazing decoration. We're hoping to sort of replace <laughs> the need to decorate with coral skeletons, which can be damaging, especially, um, especially for areas that mm. are already affected. Mm. And we also have these special corals that we've painted oh, a special kind of paint to demonstrate yeah. that areas of the reef are turning white when you, they, oh, they put that's... in warm water. Bleaching, hey? That's yeah. bleaching. Or, or, basically, you are showing what happens when, when bleaching occurs. Absolutely. Mm. So what's happening is when corals are experiencing higher than normal sea surface temperatures, mm. they get kind of stressed out and many corals are living at their upper thermal limits. Yeah. And when they get stressed, they expel their algal symbionts. So the zooxanthellae that live in their tissues and give them their energy. And without yeah. those, you can see through the coral polyp to their white calcium carbonate skeleton. And so right. it looks white and that's yes. why it's called bleaching. It's not because people are pouring bleach into the water. <laughs> it's, <Yeah. laughs> it's just a descriptive term. 
And when you see a white reef, it doesn't mean that it's dead, but it does mean that it's starving. Mm. Usually bleached reefs become overtaken by uh, seaweed and it's really hard for reefs to recover and grow back. Mm. And so any way that we can work on bringing color back to the reef, it has a shot of continuing and persevering and corals can recover. They can, and we've seen that. We just have to let them and give them that space. Absolutely. And talking about bringing coral back to the reef, you bring, you're bringing, sorry, colour, not coral, or colourful coral, to be honest. Oh. You're, bringing, you're bringing both to us as well through VR. So I mentioned the non-profit organisation, The Hydras. What a brilliant idea about using VR, because so many of us, you know, I'm sat in my garden right now. You know, I'm not able to go however many feet down to see beautiful coral. So tell us more about that. I'm super excited about this. Uh, well, Lizzie, one of my favourite things to do in the world is to take Take people diving. I just love being underwater and even more yeah. I love taking people underwater with me. Mm -hmm. I'm a dive master so I've led dives for many years. I'm a kayak guide. I love taking people into the ocean in some way. However, I can't take everyone to the ocean and so yeah. I'm really interested in using scalable technologies to bring the ocean to everybody because mm -hmm. there's such a disconnect between living on land and life underwater for a lot of reasons. Like for instance, we can't breathe underwater and not everyone can swim and it's not always available for people to visit the ocean. And exactly. so what's so exciting is this medium of virtual reality of this electronic immersion can generate presence and mm. agency and make you feel like you're there. And so it's that emotional connection that can really bridge the disconnection between scientific yeah. discovery and public understanding. Plus it's just so joyful. So mm. here's a picture of me diving in the Republic of Palau with okay. of our amazing underwater cameraman and a producer on our VR film. And he's holding this incredible camera uh, called the Virtual 2. And essentially wow. it's 13 different individual cameras mounted together in an underwater housing and was able to shoot 60 frames per second in 4K and they're mounted in pairs so that we can generate depth in the yeah. frames. What an epic bit of kit, look at that. That is absolutely fabulous. And, and um, that's what we're, I mean, all the pictures shown here or most of them shown in this chat, by the way, everyone watching, um, this is what you'll be able to experience at the end when you tell tell them um, when we share you a little bit more about going on that VR dive but um I mean I mean for you this must be a, a real opportunity to as you say create that connection absolutely and I love talking to people after they go virtually diving with me because in the experience I'm actually your dive guide and I right. get to signal to you I point out turtles <laughs> and yeah, all the hand signals <laughs> I just get to feel so connected to people and when they come out of the experience often I get to hear really cool stories about their ocean journey and whether they've ever gone diving or tide pooling or spend time at the beach and I've mm. been so just joyed by how many people have their own connection to the ocean in a really specific and unique way. And not only is the ocean beautiful and an amazing place to be, we also all rely on it. Healthy oceans, mm. healthy people. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to come, come on to that a little bit later and how we'll very much connected to the ocean, even if it's not right in front of us. But for you in this VR, what has been, do you think the most valuable thing for people going on these dives? I just love looking around and feeling submerged mm. because oceans and VR are such a match made in heaven because when you're floating, you can look up and down and all around you. When you're kind of walking on land, you don't look down as much, for instance, right. and right. just seeing a school of fish surrounding you and seeing the reef sort of building over you in these big cathedral-like structures is really incredible and to feel like you're there. And rather yeah. than you know watching a video of a scientist or a diver exploring a reef, you get to become the scientist or the diver and explore yourself. Mm, absolutely fascinating. Um, now the reefs is only part of the picture, right? I'm sure you've seen so much on and around reefs, but let's talk a little bit about how it works its way 
up up the food chain if you like up the system of bigger life what's your what's been your yeah. favorite moment on a reef oh my gosh so <laughs> coral reefs are like the rainforest of the ocean they cover less than one percent of the whole seafloor but harbor about a quarter of all marine biodiversity. And so that includes yeah. the smallest colorful sea slug or nudibranch and crabs yeah. and mantis shrimp up to uh, fish and bigger fish and then <laughs> turtles and sharks and whales and dolphins and everything that comes through a reef uses it as habitat or as mm. food and spends some portion of their life cycle on it. And so I've been so lucky. I could stare at just like a, a meter by meter area of reef for hours because there's so much going on. There's competition, there's uh, predator prey relationships. I can, I can look very close and just get totally stuck there. But when you zoom out, you're like, oh, there's a shark behind me and getting to swim with gray reef sharks or whale sharks is just a total joy. And there've even been times where I've been diving and hear humpback whales singing. And the wow. way sound works underwater is I, it feels like it's all around me and it feels like I'm swimming with them. And it's just that immersion and that experience of weightlessness and floating is absolutely magical. And to be able to swim with and, and visit this yeah. biodiversity is such a privilege. Absolutely. Yeah, it really, really is. Um, lovely picture of you there, by the way, with a manta. Oh, it must be just absolutely mm -hmm. awesome. And and to make all those connections is super important. You know, I I, I may be wrong in saying this, but I, I do feel like there's a bit of a misconception about a reef, you know, that it's kind of just stuck to the bottom of the sea. And of course, they're very beautiful to look at, but the, the power in which they kind of harness with as a food system, as a habitat for so many, um, so much life on this earth is, is very misunderstood. So, have, I mean, what do you think is the biggest misconception about coral? Well, as you say, I think um, not everyone realizes that they're living animals. They kind right. of, look, they're just swimming by. They look like they're rocks or they might be plants because they seem to be still with our sort of perception of of time <laughs> and movement. But as again, if you put a time-lapse camera the reef mm. is so busy. Different coral colonies are fighting with each other. They're moving around. They're extending their polyps. They're moving with the water currents. They are reproducing. They're migrating because they have that life history stage where they can float through the water and, and settle somewhere else. So they're incredibly dynamic. They're incredibly just lively, just not in the way that we generally perceive animals, because when we think of animals, like they run around and chase each other and climb trees, yeah. but <laughs> they are living things. And so that means that the way that we treat them and the way that we utilize them, especially for, mm -hmm. for resources like fish and any other kind of food or pharmaceuticals, we really need to take care of them because they are living and so much depends on them, including us. Absolutely. So let's talk about that. I mean, what, what for you the, have you found to be the main threats to our corals of the, of the earth and across all our oceans? Well, if we talk very generally, and this includes deep corals and cold water corals, um, things like dredging and habitat destruction and pollution is really damaging. So off the coast of California here in the colder, deeper water, we have these amazing diverse coral communities that really rely on the local protection. So luckily a lot of that is really well cared for. Um, that's not the case everywhere. And the issue with tropical shallow water coral reefs is we've lost about half of those reefs over the last 50 years. And right. that is due to just the combined effects, the cum cumulative effects of direct human disturbances uh, judging. Like overfishing judging. because when you take too many things out of the food web it sort of ripples down to the reef yeah. and vice versa so if you destroy the reef or if the reef leaches the mm -hmm. fish and the inv other invertebrates and everything else that goes up the food chain really relies on it so unfortunately a lot of places in the world are sort of getting hit from all sides yeah yeah and um, is there a particular reef? I mean, you spent so much time on the Great Barrier Reef, but um, is there a particular reef that's really facing bigger challenges than others? Because as, as you say, lots going on on our oceans right now. It's kind of hard to understand um, on a big scale. 
Yeah, well, unfortunately, there isn't just one reef that's under a lot of threat. Mm -hmm. uh, the bleaching event from 2015 to 2017 was yeah. the largest, most widespread, severe event ever recorded. Mm -hmm. And it went, it hit every ocean. So there are, are shallow water coral reefs in Eastern Africa, throughout the Indian Ocean, throughout Indonesia, Japan, um, the Great Barrier Reef. It's just uh, the Caribbean and Hawaii is just hit everywhere. And it's been very dramatic to see just in a few weeks, a reef that's been there for hundreds and, or thousands of years turn white and just die in a very short amount of time. And that was just for those who may not know what, what happened during that bleaching event. Um, could, could you break down some of the causes behind that? Yeah. So usually these bleaching events coincide with El Nino events mm -hmm. where temperatures are higher than normal. We have these warm water anomalies and mm -hmm. sometimes storms come through and prevent the sort of stagnant warm water from, from just kind of staying still and warm. And those elevated temperatures over a, you know, a couple of weeks cause corals to get stressed out and the algae that lives inside them are over oxidizing and that's really not good for the coral. And so they expel their symbionts and that they need them to survive. And so it's really a matter of higher than normal temperatures with the fact that corals that are better protected on a local level have a better chance at recovering. Because, mm. Like I mentioned, corals can recover. I've seen a reef completely wiped out by a cyclone and within about wow. five to 10 years, it was growing back. It's amazing right. what corals can do thanks to those wow. amazing reproductive mechanisms. So, oh gosh, that is absolutely incredible. How sensitive are our corals and our coral reefs? Um, we talk about changing oceans all the time um, um, as, as we're seeing that more and more. In fact, actually, let, let's talk about some of those changes and some of your research looking into that first. And, and then we can go a little bit more into how sensitive they are, because it's something I'm always thinking. I'm thinking of constantly, you know, how, how we can do our bit to help save coral. But it's um, it's hard to kind of uh, truly get to the, the bottom of, of of that exact issue. Absolutely. And so corals are often called sensitive, but I think that's a little unfair because we're putting a lot on them. Yeah, <laughs> and corals yeah, right. survived warmer periods in our earth history and they've migrated to higher latitudes and we have this amazing geological record. Right now, the issue is the rate of changing oceans. Mm -hmm. Not only the, the water chemistry and the water temperature changing, but also all of the pollution, all of the overfishing, all of the habitat destruction that's piling onto that it's just a lot for corals to overcome okay yeah and um i mean that that in itself is is really interesting because you do read all the time sensitive corals sensitive coral reefs but um there's so much to do and are you positive about the future of our corals please say yes <laughs> i have so much ocean optimism and what i love seeing is the incredible work being done around the world by community leaders, by ocean advocates, by scientists, by educators who are taking a really amazing multidisciplinary approach to addressing these issues and addressing it from a human-centered lens. Because in the end, it's all about our relationship to the ocean and whether we can continue relying on these ecosystems that we need to survive. Yeah, have, and you must have seen how close our relationship in some coastal communities is with with coral. Um, do you have any kind of stories about that, or any particular places that you've been where you've seen this kind of really intricate relationship between people and coral? Oh, absolutely, I've met a number of artisanal fishermen uh, or fishers okay. that you know go out fishing every day, and thanks to healthy reefs, they have food to feed their family or sell. And there are also amazing tourism industries. So a number of people I've met know the reef far better than I ever could. And they've grown up on it and they've explored it and they've seen changes themselves. And they also know that their livelihoods are impacted by tourism and the health of the reef. And so they're very driven to, to protect it and keep it healthy, not only mm. because it's the right thing to do and it's important for the ecology and the beauty of the reef, but it's something that they directly depend on. Mm. You can have 
a close relationship alongside these ecosystems and these habitats sustainably, right, for the future. Absolutely love it. Love the ocean optimism as well. I'm going to use that, I think. That's a really lovely one. Um, okay, we have questions flooding in and some really great ones. Um, uh, I'm not surprised by that at all. So let's let's actually head over to some of those questions. Um, we have one here. How quickly do they grow and how long can a coral live for? Good question to set us off. Great question. And so that completely depends. <laughs> So deep water cold corals are very slow growing, whereas okay. um, staghorn corals, so like these branching ones, or yeah. of the genus Acropora, are known as sort of the weedier species, and they grow quickly, and they're known to be some of the first colonizers of a reef that's been damaged, whereas a boulder coral or a brain coral might grow more slowly. And of course, uh, there are trade-offs to that. So the slower growing species are generally more resistant to changing oceans as opposed right. to fast growing um, acroporids or branching corals, which are generally the most vulnerable. Okay, so are we seeing that kind of across species then? We're seeing a faster decline in those species that are, are faster growing? That is exactly right. And what, with uh, regards to the question of how long do they live, that's actually a complicated question and a complicated answer because <laughs> I'm not in surprised. a way, because Corals are always cloning and that genotype gets replicated in a way they just keep going and going unless they're like completely stopped. So in some wow. way you might see them as immortal uh, if they're just growing on the ancestors. So if you look at a coral reef, the surface of it, the skin of it is that soft bodied living animal and everything mm -hmm. below is the calcium carbonate skeleton that is built up over generations and generations. Okay. And a single coral polyp can also be eaten by a fish. And so they yeah. have natural predators. It's all part of this, the ecosystem. And they'll just keep living until we stop them, which we're it's doing. Like a, it's like a multi-layered cake of coral, <laughs> coral goodness. This is just, it's mind blowing everyone. This is incredible. Um, um, oh, great question came in. Please discuss reproduction by cuttings to propagate oh, new yeah. corals. Nice, so, nice question there. Great question. So there are a lot of amazing practitioners that are experimenting and trying coral gardening or coral planting. So if I were to take a little piece of this coral branch, well, not this because it's a 3D printed model, yeah. <laughs> one and gently place it or, or grow it in the lab or put it back on the reef and use special glue, it can keep growing. And it can wow. have done this to create sort of coral gardens in areas that have been damaged. Of course, wow. my big question is, will it get damaged again the same way the first reef was damaged? And so there's a lot of interesting research into how to do these, these uh, fragments of coral and microfragging is what it's called to increase the rate of growth and maybe even breed thermally tolerant uh, species that allow the corals to withstand greater stress. Okay, that's fascinating. So that initial coral will still will still survive as a coral. Just part of that will then be essentially sustainably taken elsewhere to, for regrowth. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. And um, I have I've have heard of that before, but um, you know, just the power of that. I guess the future of our corals, those particularly in decline, would just be awesome. You know, if they could take that forward. Um, how do corals contribute to, uh, to the animal kingdom? And we've touched on this briefly from large and small. Could you sum that up? It's a bit of a tricky one. Uh, I mean, the animal kingdom is so huge. <laughs> so <laughs> I will just... maybe specify to the ocean. And yeah. I mean, from a scientist's point of view, they're just so unique and fascinating. And from mm. the coral's point of view, they support so much. They mm. are the ecosystem engineers of these habitats and they build the three-dimensional structure that allow little fish or little crabs or shrimp to hide in them and that that rugosity as it's called is what allows for so much life on the reef mm -hmm. and i mentioned this before but about 25 percent of all marine animals rely on coral reefs because they create this habitat I mean, that is that is the fact, isn't it? That that figure is 25%. That is that says it all. Incredibly important. Um, 
Fabulous questions coming in. Okay, we've got another one here. Um, can coral animals die from man-made pollution in the sea? And how are we recycling microplastics in the ocean? So let's start with the first one. <laughs> Great question. And the answer is yes. Unfortunately, a lot of the things we put into the ocean are affecting it. It used to be thought that dilution was the solution to pollution, but we find out that, you know, even in a place as big as the entire ocean is still affected by mm. us putting our waste into it. An example mm. of that is fertilizer runoff or runoff from cities. Um, so any kind of waste can create an overabundance of nutrients in the water that can cause algae blooms or algae blooms. And that can smother corals because they need that access to light. And so you have these sort of um, ripple effects, the domino effects of putting extra stuff in the ocean that we might not have thought it has these mm -hmm. effects. And so mm -hmm. unfortunately in a lot of places that don't have proper waste treatment or are stirring up sediment, the corals get covered by algae or by um, sediments and they just can't continue to survive. That's a really good point, you know. Do you think we're fully aware of the impacts we, we may be having on our corals? I, I don't think as much as we should. It's, you know, it's very much out of sight, out of mind problem. Um, quite often we just see the surface of the ocean and it looks calm and beautiful, but there's a lot going beneath the surface and the things that we do on land truly impact what's happening underwater. And fast changes as well. And of course that question about microplastics and the impact of, of plastics um, in our ocean. Does plastic impact coral at all? It does, unfortunately. <laughs> Oh, no. My um, colleagues and co-founders of the Hydras, Nora, she discovered that coral animals are actually ingesting microplastics. So really? So this in the lab where she put microplastics in the water that the corals feed on, because as I mentioned, they also, you know, take yep. things out of the water with their tentacles and they're ingesting microplastics and that can really be disruptive to their ability to feed and survive. Yeah. Sure. And I know there's a number of um, cleanup operations for, for microplastics, but microplastics is one of the biggest ocean, uh, problems in that ocean. Um, whether they're primary or secondary, um, it's a really kind of hard to grasp uh, issue that our oceans are, fa are facing. And unfortunately, it's sad to hear that our corals are facing those issues as well. Um, is the damage to our reefs really reversible? And taking CO2 actively out of the air is nearly impossible. Um, they're a physicist, they say, and what can, oh, there's lots of questions here. So let's start with this first. I mean, ocean optimism, you've talked about that. I'm an ocean optimist now, definitely. <laughs> but can we reverse some of that damage, really? Yeah, well, I really want to thank that physicist for that question because it really does come, come down to that in a lot of ways. So when it comes to addressing the warming oceans, we really need to address the fact that there's an excess amount of CO2 in our atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, which also gets absorbed into our ocean and changes the chemistry and the ocean is warming. And so I would want both uh, mitigation and adaptation. And so when it comes to sequestration, as our physicist, physicist friend points out, it is very difficult um, yeah. in terms of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere or out of the ocean. And there's a lot of really fascinating research that's going into that. And I, I'm, I'm excited to see how that evolves. Also, yeah. I think we should uh, address the root of the problem. And as an international community of people really take a stand in preventing excess CO2 being released into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I think it's really up to us to use our powers as citizens and consumers to prevent that from getting worse. And corals can recover. Again, if yeah. we, we tackle these problems, we mm -hmm. have a really good chance of keeping corals and people healthy. It's a good question. I think largely because many of us see, you know, want to do our bit, but it's hard to actually make that positive impact. But the initial thing is to to slow down the way that we are consuming, the way that we live. So, you know, it's um it's a question which I think um we should be not asking yet. We should first be asking the question, you know, what can I do every day to really as a consumer make those changes to slow down that process? But nevertheless, um, good to have a physicist on. That's great. <laughs> um, what can young people do to help um, protect our oceans? Great question. I love that question. And I'm just hearing a bunch of new solutions and ideas every day. And I want to preface this by saying that 
we all need to decide on our own what works for us, what we can. Mm. Um, I feel like a lot of people, including myself, sometimes get overwhelmed with not being able to do everything all the time. But there are so many small ways that we can each protect our ocean every day. And one of my favorite sayings is, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So what I'm about to say, you don't have to do it all. <laughs> I'm just giving yeah. options. Um, one of the best ways that you can protect the health of our oceans and the health of people that rely on them is to think about how you source your seafood. Mm -hmm. So sustainably sourced seafood means better jobs, more jobs, and healthier fish and more fish. And mm -hmm. so a really great resource that I highly recommend is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch program. And they have a free app. So if you're ordering food or buying food, you can enter the sort of fish that you're interested in, where it comes from and learn more about mm -hmm. whether it's a quote unquote green choice, which I think should be a blue choice <laughs> uh, yes. or a red choice, which may be something you want to avoid because it can be caught through damaging methods that affect, affect reefs or other parts of the ocean. Uh, another thing is to really think about um, your waste and how much um, marine waste you're producing, whether it's related to your community's recycling programs or waste treatment, or you as an individual. And then finding ways to reduce your, your carbon footprint. And like I said, it's a little bit hard to go completely carbon neutral, but there are ways you can reduce. There are ways that you can offset. And yeah. all of the choices really, really add up. And like mm. I mentioned before, use your power as a, as a consumer, support businesses that are ocean-minded or sustainably-minded, and use your power as a citizen. Vote for ways to protect the ocean. Absolutely. Super important uh, one just at the end there. And um, I would also add on to that, actually, go to Hydrus and learn more about and get, learn about them and about their dives, go on a VR dive and, um, and just get to know the ocean, get to know the nitty gritty science behind it. If you're interested in it, you will learn everything there is to know with Erica herself. And um, one last question before we go, um, do you think it is possible to use artificial intelligence technologies like machine learning and deep learning to help save coral reefs? Good question to I love that question. And there are so many brilliant people working on that right now. And so for instance, um, Dr. Grace Young is working on machine learning to help track ocean health and help mm -hmm. identify fish species. And we have so much amazing data and big data is such a great way to monitor and understand and study our ocean so that we know how to better protect it. And absolutely, there's, there are so many great examples of machine learning and AI. Um, the first thing that comes to mind actually is you might've seen that photo of me diving with a manta ray um, and you could see that there were markings on its belly and yes. those markings are unique for each individual like a fingerprint or a QR code. And so for scientists to track these animals, they don't need to put a physical tagging device on them. They just need to use their photos and all of these photos together, thousands and thousands collected around the world can use machine learning algorithms to identify and track these individuals so that we can better understand this threatened and endangered species. Fantastic. The power of technology. See, slowly learning more about our oceans and learning how to protect them. Erica Woolsey, you have been absolutely fantastic. It's been so good to chat to you and to learn more about your work, your research. Um, before we go, really exciting. I'm hoping everyone um, is clinging on with excitement because how can people go on a VR dive? Tell us, and, um, and I'm pretty sure we got a code or something for them, right? Yes, so I just made that reference to the QR codes on the man manta bellies. And in a moment, <laughs> we're gonna show a graphic of a manta ray with a QR code. So what you can do is take your smartphone and open your camera app. And mm -hmm. when you see the QR code, the link should just pop up and you can open it, make sure you open it in the YouTube app. Yep. And you'll be able to see our 360 dive, which is called Immerse, that my amazing team at the Hydras has developed. And you can watch it on your phone in a few different ways. You can move your phone around and see the reef around you as you move. 
it will love it. Or you can drag with your finger. Or yep. if you happen to have a cardboard viewer like this, I put a little mask yes. sticker on it. <laughs> you can <laughs> you can press the special VR icon in the mm -hmm. app. It will then then turn into a split screen, which you can turn sideways and put into your VR viewer like this. Oh yeah. You'll have <laughs> total immersion. Go exciting! The real life dive. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Erica, thank you ever so much for coming on live. Um, I can't wait to see what you're up to next. I'll be going on a VR dive right after this. Anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? Just thank you so much for coming diving with me. Yeah, it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, you do fantastic work and I'm sure everyone enjoy, um, on here has enjoyed it and has enjoyed listening to you. So thank you. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. You can see that QR code right now. Go, go, go. We hope you've enjoyed it. Um, from spawning mass, incredible coral spawning events to learning about the intricate cup corals that you may have on your reefs on your doorstep and going on a VR dive with Erica herself. I mean, what an incredible live uh, this has been. My mind has been blown about these incredible marine invertebrates and it seems we have lots and lots to do to help conserve them. So if you're passionate about the ocean, coral reefs or anything that Erica has talked about today, please go on that QR code now, go on a VR dive and uh, we'll see you again here on the channel next week, same time. Bye. <laughs>